Services and former Dallas Fed President Richard Fisher is part of a task force set there to reopen the Texas economy. He joins us now on the Newsline. Richard, thank you very much for being here. You know, the last time we spoke, it was because of the pain in the oil and gas industry in Texas. It's gone a long way even further <laughs> south than that now. Texas and the rest of America wants to get back to work. How can it do so safely starting in Texas? Well, Dom, thanks for having me on. The, the important thing to understand about Texas is obviously we're a huge oil producer. We produce 5 million barrels a day. That's only surpassed by Russia, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. But this is a very diversified economy. And the governor yesterday, Governor Abbott, who's working double time overtime on this stuff, made his announcement for initial openings for the Texas economy. Why is this important, Dom? Uh, this is an economy that's bigger than Canada's, bigger than Russia's, bigger than South Korea's, bigger than Australia's, bigger than Spain. And I think it's an important case study for the rest of the United States to see how this proceeds. I mean, already we saw an earlier report on your uh, before your show on Simon Property. They're the largest mall operators in the country, 49 malls. They announced they're opening up. 21 of those 49 malls are in the state of Texas. So... I would just be watching this carefully. Hopefully, it'll be a good case study for other states. But in and of itself, this state is very important to the U.S. economy, where 20 percent of all exports from this country comes out of one state, Texas. And the governor's working very hard, as is our task force, to work principally driven by medical guidelines in dealing with what is safest for our citizens. But it's a good case study for the rest of the United States. And to me, it informs us that we are likely to have a U-shaped recovery. We're trying to shorten that here in Texas. It still takes time for businesses to reconfigure, for employees to feel confident coming back into work. And we'll just have to study this to see what we can learn about the potential recovery shape for the rest of the country. So, so, so it's, it's, you bring up the idea that Texas, in its size, is massive when it comes to the restarting of the U.S. economy. It, 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 Data Trek Research and, and Nick Collis and his team there tweeted something out earlier in the past couple of hours saying that half of U.S. gross domestic product comes from just eight states. It's California, <laughs> Texas, New York, Florida, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and New Jersey. These are the Correct. restarts that must go well in order to bring the American economy back quickly. So Texas, obviously one of them. What else needs to happen with those other states extrapolating beyond just what's happening with Texas? Well, they're all going to have to be guided by the medical guidelines and the guidelines of science and data. That's what we're trying to do here. That's what the governor's trying to do. Um, we are the second largest in the country. California, of course, is number one. And remember this, too, Dom. New York is the financial center of the country and the world. I would argue that in terms of our entrepreneurial spirit here, we are the heartbeat of the capitalist system in the United States. And it's important with 29 million people, 10 million more than New York, that we get this right. And that's what we're just trying to do here. But it's going to be a slower process. We're doing it gradually. The governor's gradually opening up, again, guided by medical guidelines. And I think there's a good lesson here to understand the shape of the recovery for the rest of the country, including those other states as well. They all have to do it according to their own needs, their own mortality rates, their own infection rates. Uh, we're just trying to... Uh, bend the mortality rate of business and revive it and doing it according to medical standards. So the, US, the, the, the CNBC viewer knows full well what exactly is happening to the oil and gas industry overall globally, but specifically to what's happening in Texas right now. They've been watching our air consistently. Let's talk about free markets and government intervention. There will be a mix of things that need to happen to make sure that the U.S. oil and gas business kind of survives this process and is able to support the U.S. economy going forward. What exactly is that mix coming from the likes of a former Federal Reserve president in Dallas, Texas? Well, first of all, I, I would say that the state of Texas is probably the least, has the least amount of government intervention in its own economy. We're a very free enterprise. Having said that, the governor has the, the podium and the rule to issue uh, edicts and particularly to issue executive orders that are providing just the suggestions and guidelines for how people should open up. It'll fall into the hands of the counties and the cities like Dallas, which has its own effort uh, to provide additional guidance. But businesses will develop according to what their needs are and their long-term prospects. And this is where we have that experiment taking place. With regard to the Fed, 
the Fed is, <laughs> as Steve Leisman just pointed out, going to expand its balance sheet dramatically. It's been directed by Congress to do certain things that undo some of Dodd-Frank and particularly Section 13.3. And they're doing everything they possibly can within a central bank context uh, to get funds out and encourage banks to lend funds throughout the economy, whether it's in this state or anyplace else. And I think that's what they will focus on at their meeting that's taking place presently. Um, and we'll probably get a little bit of guidance coming out of it in terms of how they expect to proceed. But right now, they're just trying to get it right. Put the pipes in place, get liquidity through the pipes, get the programs nailed down, and properly operating. All right, Richard, I, I also want to bring in PIMCO's Erin Brown into the conversation right now. I know that she's got sure. some, some questions for you as well. Thanks, Richard. Um, so with the, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the Fed meeting tomorrow with the FOMC meeting. You know, clearly yeah. the Fed's already at the effective lower bound, and they've put in a number of additional Fed facilities in place to provide liquidity to the market. So I'm really curious your thoughts on, you know, what now, what steps do you think that the Fed could take from here um, to provide additional support? You know, there's obviously been discussion about yield curve, curve control or additional forward guidance. And so I'm curious on your recommendations and, and how you, as a former Fed governor, think about what steps or what tools the Fed could do to further enhance liquidity and provide support to the market? Well, first of all, they pulled everything off the shelf that we had developed 2008, 2009, very quickly between meeting dates. That was critical. The Congress has given them additional firepower and uh, undone some of the 13-3 restrictions they imposed on us after the last rescue package. So I think right now the focus is on just getting it right, making sure it works. As far as guidance is concerned, that is important. Um, and I'm sure that there will be in the uh, House press conference some comments on guidance going forward. He'll also be asked about the balance sheet for sure. And I do personally expect it to push up to the $10 trillion level. Uh, and then I think the last thing that's important to remember, and you know this better than I do because you're active in the markets, and that is that the Fed does not control the yield curve to the extent it used to. The 10-year is being determined significantly by markets and people rushing to either hoard dollar securities, U.S. dollar securities, uh, or build their cash pipelines, and that's what's driving the dollar. And as we've seen, we've had a strengthening dollar now up 25 percent on a trade-weighted basis since December of 2013. Uh, this year, about 3.6 percent. It keeps adding on to that. And I think this has to be borne in mind in setting monetary policy. We're going to have a strong dollar. The market's going to direct money into U.S. dollars. That helps the Treasury. It also hooks down the cost of financing and the expansion of these deficit spending emergency measures that we have to take. All right. All right, Richard, I, I also want to bring in Josh because I know he has a question for you as well. Josh Brown. Josh. Hi, Mr. Fisher. N nice Josh to hear from you. Guy, um, <laughs> no, no. No, no, not today. I have a philosophical question for you. We've seen financial crises reshape um, society in the past, and I expect this time will be no different. Um, a lot of the social safety net came about as a result of what happened in the 1930s. And I think this time we're almost de facto playing with an experiment of universal basic income. When you look at the expansion of benefits for the unemployed, it turns out 50 percent of people are better off not working right now than getting their old yeah. jobs back. And I know that that benefit, that extra benefit goes away in July. I understand it's not permanent. But what if it turns out that the business community looks at what goes on this summer and decides, hey, you know what? This whole universal basic income thing isn't so bad. We had consumers that we never thought would come through our doors um, or our websites buying things in ways that they hadn't before. Let's keep this thing going. Could we see uh, UBI gain some ground among Republicans and, and, dare I say, even libertarians as a result of this crisis? Well, it clearly is changing the way the economy is structured, and there is a tendency towards what you just spoke about. Um, it is noteworthy that people can make more money by not working, at least for a couple of, couple of months here, than by working. But I think there are other things that are changing and are structural changes in our economy. So employers, for example, whether they're for-profit or not-for-profit or government entities, they're going to be required to operate going forward with heightened awareness of sanitary norms and cleaning and spacing and 
new ways of interacting, communicating, et cetera. And then we're going to have post-COVID changes in behaviors and demand patterns of consumers of goods and services. So this will impact that, what you just mentioned, but there are more fundamental changes taking place and businesses are going to have to adapt accordingly. And workers are going to have to decide when they feel safe to come back into the workforce. We're focused on that heavily right here in North Texas, particularly the city of Dallas, which has been the biggest job generator within the biggest job generating state in the union. Right. But you're right. This is a gradual socialization. The question is how long can it stay on? And do we have the capacity to reverse it over time? It's going to be a big question for sure.